Savannah Bihar. Savannah means golden. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu the golden farm. And Vihar means moving. Lord Chaitanya came dancing here in this very place. There was a great king named Savannah Sain who appeared here in the Satya Yuga. And he was a, this, his, he had a palace here, he had his, uh, a fort or palace here. And he was living here with his family. He was pious, but he was attached, very attached, materialistic. In his old age, he was attached to the family and the property and everything. But somehow, he was very fortunate that Narada Muni came to him and gave him instruction. Narada Muni told him how that you're so fortunate that you're living here, you're residing in Navadvip Dam, that this is a holy place, a very special holy place. And Narada Muni told him that in the Kali Yuga, Lord, that the most merciful form of the Lord will appear here in a golden color in the Kali Yuga and he will perform wonderful pastimes. We heard yesterday, the Navadvip Dham is Odarya, right? Odarya Lila, mercy, great mercy. So when the king heard about it, he thought, oh, I'm so unfortunate. I'm missing, I'm going to miss it. How will I ever get to see this Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? He was lamenting that he would not be able to see this form of the Lord. And he was meditating, and then Lord Chaitanya appeared dancing before him. And then Lord Chaitanya told Suvarna Sain, he told him that in the Kali Yuga, you will take birth and you will be one of my associates, you will be one of my followers, and you will appear as Buddhimanta Khan. And as Buddhimanta Khan, you'll be very wealthy, and of course we know from the Chaitanya Lila, Buddhimanta Khan paid for the marriage of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So that's proper use of wealth, right? Those of you who've got a lot of wealth, you use it, build that TOVP. <laughs> uh, oh, Kavi Chandra Maharaj also once helped with Shantipur too. You know? <laughs> if you can sponsor some. Anyway, use your wealth for Krishna, that's the point. So we're going to hear now Kavi uh, Pancharatna Prabhu and his uh, company. Thank you, Maharaj. This Maharaj said, not very far to our camp. The next stop is our camp. So we have a few more speakers here, first of all, before we go on. Take advantage, right? Maharaj was telling me the international party is the best one. They have the most interest, the most eagerness to hear. Some of the parties, they're only interested when is Prasadam. <laughs> and other parties, when, where's the camp? I want to sleep. <laughs> and how far are we from Mayapur? I want to go back to Mayapur. But on this party, devotees are eager to hear. So that, that this is the enthusiasm, we see this enthusiasm from Lord Shiva, his eagerness to hear. He was so eager, he came on Lord Brahma's swan because he wanted to hear this Gorakata. So like all of you, you've all come out on this Parikram, you have that enthusiasm, Utsahan, right? Utsahan, this enthusiasm, very important in Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada recognize that that's one of the main qualifications which he saw in his disciples. They didn't know anything, they weren't rich, they couldn't do anything very well, but whatever he told them to do, they had great enthusiasm. They would do it. Prabhupada sent devotees all over the world, different parts of the world, going open centers, and they did it. And they had that enthusiasm. So Prabhupada writes in Nectar of Instruction, in every endeavor, Three things are important. Utsahan, Nishya, Darya, right? Enthusiasm, patience, and determination. So, especially in a Krishna consciousness, and coming on Parikrama is very important. Have that enthusiasm. Be eager to hear. We've been hearing about the meanings of the different islands. We heard on the first day about the meaning of Antardweep. 
Jaipataka Maharaj was telling us the meaning of Antar Dweep, and then we heard about the meaning of Godruma Dweep yesterday from Bhakti Purushottam Maharaj. So today, Rajendra Nandana Prabhu is going to tell us something about the meaning of Maja Dweep. Coming to holy places, Taking bath in the holy rivers and all of these things is not so much encouraged. Naratam Das Thakur says just another bewilderment of the mind to go to the holy places and just simply be there. But what's important is coming to the holy place to associate and hearing from the devotees who live there. So that's a special feature of Parikrama that we have so many senior devotees all willing to come and share their realizations with us. So now we're going to hear something from Kavi Chandra Swami Maharaj about Naimisharanya. We also have His Holiness Jai Pataka Swami Maharaj coming very soon to speak up. Thank you Maharaj. One verse we never recited, we can recite. Krishna Swadamu Pagate Dharma Jnana Dipi Saha Kalo Nishtam Drisham Mesha Pura Narto Drano Drataha So this verse is spoken in answer to the question put by the sages. In the first canto, first chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam, we have the questions by the sages. Six questions were put. And the sixth question was, where are all the religious principles to be found now that Lord Krishna has departed from the world? So long as Lord Krishna was present, then there was no problem. Everyone understood Lord Krishna is the personification of all religious principles. But with the departure of Lord Krishna from the world, then where are the religious principles found? So then the reply is given that the Srimad Bhagavatam is as brilliant as the sun. And it has arisen just after the departure of Lord Krishna for his own abode. Persons who have lost their vision due to the dense darkness of this age of Kali will get light from this Purana. So reading Srimad Bhagavatam or just contacting Srimad Bhagavatam is actually not different from contacting Srila Prabhupada. One of the things we did want to speak about was remembering Srila Prabhupada. And we can do that best by reading his books. Prabhupada was often asked, who will lead the society when I'm gone? Prabhupada said, I will live forever. I will live by my books. So reading Srila Prabhupada's books Yes, contacting Srila Prabhupada's books, very, very powerful. We have that experience, as one devotee was say, quoting, Prabhupada said, uh, from every page you can feel Krishna, you can feel the presence of Krishna in every page, every syllable. So Srimad Bhagavatam is no ordinary literature. And it's due to Srila Prabhupada that Srimad Bhagavatam has become more and more prominent now. In the past, very few, very, very rare people that people had even heard of Srimad Bhagavatam. Just like we see also, of course, Bhagavad Gita. Because of the Krishna Consciousness Movement, Bhagavad Gita is being introduced all over the world and becoming very prominent. Just r recently, a year or two ago, there was an incident in Russia. They were trying to ban the Bhagavad Gita. And the, in, in China also, there was one professor of Sanskrit. He published his own edition of Bhagavad Gita, and he condemned Krishna. He said, Krishna is immoral. It was because of Krishna that battle of Kurukshetra took place. Krishna was responsible for all of these people dying. Like this, he was attacking Krishna. Yeah, so the Prabhupada ordered when Prabhupada uh, heard about these different commentaries, Prabhupada would tell some of his sannyasis, you have to write to this person, and you point out every mistake he has made in his edition of the Bhagavad Gita. You write to him and tell him everything he's got wrong. 
So this is our duty as devotees. Like in Russia, they were trying to ban Bhagavad Gita. They were saying, no, we don't need this book. But, you know, with the help of the Indian government and so many devotees around the world, then it was a powerful influence on the Russian government and the people in Russia had to admit that they had to accept the Bhagavad Gita. And so Bhagavad Gita is being translated into so many languages, so many parts of the world, people are becoming more and more appreciative of Bhagavad Gita. And then from Bhagavad Gita, then we, of course they have to go on to read Srimad Bhagavatam. Bhagavad Gita is just one book. Sometimes people are surprised. Uh, one Christian man was saying to me, he said, wow, you read this book, it's so big. The Bhagavad Gita, you know, he saw the Bhagavad Gita and he was saying, wow, it's such a big book. Do you read all this book? I said, we don't just read this one book. We have a whole set of 30 volumes, you know. We have so many books to read. Prabhupada also joked how in Christianity they simply have one book. But we have many books, many, many books, and we are publishing them, distributing them in all the languages of the world. Of course, the Srimad Bhagavatam is the cream of all the Vedic literature. Through Srimad Bhagavatam, people get to understand something of the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. Now, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was in Banaras, people said, just a sentimentalist, right? Just chanting and dancing. But then when they started to discuss Vedanta, then they understood that it was Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who actually knew Vedanta more than they did. And they were, con their minds were changed, they were converted to con take up Vaishnavism. So this is the power of chanting the holy name, hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, these activities given to us by Srila Prabhupada. So we should always feel indebted to Srila Prabhupada, we should always remember him. We try to do that. That's why we have our Guru Puja, even we're out here on Parikrama every day. We have to Prabhupada's Guru Puja. We want everyone to cultivate their relationship with the founder Acharya of the Krishna Consciousness Movement. Srila Prabhupada Ki! propagated the chanting of the Maha Mantra. He didn't say that we should just chant his name, but Prabhupada, the Acharyas, particularly Jagannath Das Babaji Maharaj, actually he was the one who initially popularized the chanting of the Panchatattva Mantra, that they encouraged that, that we chant the Panchatattva Mantra first, and then chant Hare Krishna mantra. But not, Prabhupada didn't say that we have to chant the Panchatattva mantra for a long time. He just said chant it a couple of times and then chant Hare Krishna mantra. In fact, you can even chant it just once. That's the program, that's the procedure for approaching the worship of Krishna through the chanting of his holy names. First we worship Lord Chaitanya. By the mercy of Lord Chaitanya, then we can get the mercy of Krishna. We can approach Radha and Krishna. We cannot directly go to Krishna. We have to go to Krishna through the devotees. So we first of all take, take the mercy of the Panchatattva chanting their names and then we qualify to chant the Hare Krishna mantra. So it's like that. I hope that's clear. Here's some more questions. Is there a scriptural reference to do parigrama with or without s slippers? <laughs> well, it's it's a it's a general practice in performing parigrama that it's considered the holy place that. You go in, in a holy place, you go to a temple, we don't wear our shoes inside the temple. So similarly also here in this holy dam, 
we shouldn't really be wearing shoes, walking on the parikrama. Generally that's the procedure. Of course, nowadays the, the, the conditions that have made parikrama very much more difficult, that uh, there's a lot of and very difficult roads with sto a lot of stones and you know, people can be easily many people get their feet their feet become injured so on it makes it very difficult if we were simply walking through the fields as parikrama used to be even when i first began parikrama you know something like 1980s when we were first doing parikrama we were going mainly through the fields and i was going barefooted but over the years the size of the parikrama party increased considerably in the beginning the parikrama party when we were first doing it we were less than a hundred devotees so it was not difficult for us to go across the fields, through the fields and on the narrow roads. But now we have these big parties and you have big loud sound systems and four-wheeled vehicles. It makes it very difficult to go on these roads. The farmers also don't want us going through their fields and damaging the crops. So we're obliged to stay on the roads. But on the roads, of course, it's all rough roads. There's a lot of stones, there's a, it's very wearing on the feet. It makes it very difficult. But generally the tradition is not to wear slippers on parikrama. And we see also when, when people don't wear slippers, then you don't kick up so much dust. When we all wear shoes, then we kick up a lot of dust everywhere when we go. So the next question is, someone said, what is the role of astrology for devotees? Well, astrology is a material science. It's not spiritual. But we do see that some of the great devotees, the great acharyas like Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur and uh, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati and so on, you know, they knew astrology. They were very familiar with the science of astrology. And so, from the birth chart from the positions of different planets, we can understand a lot of things about the nature of a person. So it, for material things, it's, it, it can give some guidance. It's not usually considered 100%. We don't consider astrology to be the absolute truth. But it can, it can give some guidance particularly for material things like marriage and so on, then it can, it can give some guidance, it can give some indication. And for careers, understanding how people should be properly engaged, proper, what work they should be doing, then you can get some guidance from astrology. So, so the next the question is, familiarity breeds contempt. So what can we do to ensure that we don't become material, that we don't become over familiar to spiritual personalities or spiritual paraphernalia? What can we do? Well, we can simply be reminded about these things. We can simply be uh, conscious. Uh, pay attention to how other people treat them and try to deal respectfully with everything, seeing everything in relation to Krishna. Yeah, people may become over familiar with their books, 
They put them on the floor, they don't take care of them, or at bead bags, we leave them lying around, or sometimes prasadam, we become over familiar with it, we simply eat it for our own sense gratification, we don't take it in Krishna consciousness, we don't honor it properly. So we have to hear, we have to regularly hear, that's why we have these programs, we have classes morning and evening, and we have proper books, we have to read them again and again, we have to hear from different devotees, we have to be reminded. If we are becoming over familiar, then that's what's required. Okay. So then someone asks, why do we have to do parikram? Why do we have to do parikrama? Well, you don't have to do it. If you don't want to do it, we don't force people. All right. But it's an opportunity to know more about the Lord and his pastimes. It's also an opportunity for us to visit the different places where the Lord performed his pastimes and to hear about the pastimes which he performed in the particular place. This is, an, this is one of the angas of devotional service. We explained on a previous occasion that this is serving the lotus feet of the Lord. When you go and visit the holy places, perform this parikrama, it is not different from serving the lotus feet of the Lord. So it's also a nice opportunity to have association with devotees and to hear from so many different devotees. We get very attached to our material situation, living in our homes, we become comfortable, even in our ashrams we can become very comfortable. Prabhupada talked about how even the bird gets attached to passing stool in one place. So he said in the same way people often, a bit like these birds, we become attached. We have our own little place, we have our own little arrangement for our comfort. So parikrama helps us to cultivate detachment. It takes us away from all of these attachments. We need that sometimes, to get free from all of our entanglements in the material world. Sometimes we don't realize how attached we are until we leave, until you go out. And then we see how, how eager people are to go back. Right? Once they get out of their home, then they're very eager to go back to their home, to their own little comfortable place. So someone is quoted the verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, Aho Bhakti Yam Stanakalakutam, from the third canto. Uddhava is speaking, describing the mercy of Lord Krishna. How shall I take shelter of one more merciful than he who gave the position of mother to a she-demon? So the question is, it seems Krishna is no less merciful than Mahaprabhu. Well, yes, that was a special case, Putana. But Lord Chaitanya is giving mercy to everyone. Not only, not just one demon, but Lord Chaitanya is distributing mercy to everyone through the Panchatattva, through the Lord Nityananda and his devotees, through the Sankirtan movement. Lord Krishna was very reserved about who he gave mercy to. Putana was a special case. Some people say that 
In her previous life, she was actually the daughter of Bali Maharaj, and she was upset that her father had been arrested by Lord Vamanadev and put into Satapaloka. And so, it was Putana was not an ordinary demon, but Lord Chaitanya gives mercy to so many demons, so many Jagai and Madais, not just one. Someone says, Chani Pandit says that traveling invites old age. So please tell, please tell us how we can become strong in Krishna consciousness when we are old. So when you're old, you should take shelter of the Krishna consciousness movement. Get out from home. Don't just sit at home like Dhritarashtra. Don't just be entangled in your family and, com and making your own little comfortable place, but you have to get out from the home. You have to getting out from the home means coming to the Krishna consciousness movement. There's no retirement in Krishna consciousness. We see that Srila Prabhupada, as he got older, he worked harder, he worked more. He did produced more books, he did more traveling, more preaching. As the older he got, the more intense he became. One devotee describes, he said, Prabhupada was like a, the runner in a, a long race. During the race, he's running and he's running, but when he comes to the final lap, he knows this is the last lap, then he goes even faster. In the final burst of strength of speed. And so he said Prabhupada's life was like that. He was preaching and trying to spread Krishna consciousness throughout his life and when it came to the final stages of his life he intensified his service to Krishna. So like that, old age does not mean you reduce your service, it means you increase your service. So that's how we can counteract So some questions about Hari Har. First of all says, how did Hari and Hara get to be in one body? So this we said this is a form of the this form of the deity is there. This is uh, to show that Lord Shiva is very dear to Lord Hari. That they appear in one body. They're almost the same. So they're, they're, they appear like that in the deity form, but not that Lord Shiva and Hari are actually one, there's a difference. Lord Hari is Vishnu, and Vishnu has certain qualities which are not found in Lord Shiva. But Lord Shiva is almost God, right? The relationship is like yogurt and milk. Lord Vishnu or Hari is like the milk. So milk can become yogurt. So in the same way Lord Hari can become Lord Shiva, but Lord Shiva cannot become Lord Hari. But he is a very, Lord Shiva is a very dear servant of Lord Hari. So they are shown to, uh, uh, appearing together in one deity form. So then someone asks, how did the Hari Har deities manifest? What? Well, well the de these deities are not very common. We don't find them in very many places. We're, the one deity there in Harihar Shetra there in Navadvip. I don't know how that deity came to be there. It's been there for a long time. Uh, Pankaj uh, Janani Vas Prabhu may know a little, may know more about me. I'm I'm not so familiar with all the history there. 
And then someone asks about the difference between Gopi Bhava and Radha Bhav. Yeah, it says, are they different? I don't think they're very different. Gopi Bhava and Radha Bhav, it's the same thing, same kind of thing. The, this uh, love or ecstasy in the mood of the gopis or in the mood of Srimati Radharani, we don't see a big difference, we don't see any real difference there. The gopis, and of all the gopis, Srimati Radharani is the topmost. Radharani is also a gopi. And so we don't make any real distinction between the two. Someone says, how to remain steady after years in renunciation and intense devotional service? How to, mean, how to remain steady year after year in renunciation and devotional service? How to remain steady? Well, stay involved in the Krishna consciousness movement. Just keep yourself engaged. You have, everyone needs to have some service. You have to get some proper service arranged, have a regular program and keep up the association with devotees. You want to go regularly to the temple. Sometimes people think, well, we'll just do everything at home, no need to go to the temple. But when you start to do everything at home, then you see the standards go down a lot. So it's much better if you make the if you have the habit to go to the temple and associate in the temple and be with the devotees in the temple. You will hear classes regularly, you will see proper deity worship and it will be done punctually. You do things at home and you always change the standards, you compromise, you're not steady. So if you want to remain steady in Krishna consciousness, we recommend Take shelter of the Krishna Consciousness Movement. It's the best thing you can do. So then someone says, when we pass by the Dambasis, how shall we respond? How to greet the Dambasis? One, should we say Hare Krishna? Two, give books. Three, giving books for building loving relationships or something else. Well, certainly we do like to greet people by saying Hare Krishna. Then people immediately know, they can understand who we are, what we're doing, where we're from. If we say Hare Krishna, all the Damvasis here, they're familiar with us. So yes, we want to say Hare Krishna and if you have some books, you'd like to give some books, you can give, you can give a book to them. You have to ask them if they're interested. We want to be polite and be respectful to them. We definitely want to be very careful how we deal with the local people. Because if we, have bad, if we have a good relationship, then they can be very helpful. But if we have a bad relationship with them, then they can give us a lot of trouble, a lot of problems. Just like I remember in England, Prabhupada told us about dealing with the Hindu community. He said, Hindus are like, they're like uh, some pottery, a clay pot or a clay cup. He said, if once you crack it, the, the, then it is ruined. It's no good anymore. It doesn't look good. So in the same way like that, you deal with the, these people, the Damvasis or the Indian community, and if you upset them, if you have a, get off to a bad relationship with them, then it's very hard to again get their trust and confidence in our Krishna Consciousness Movement. So we have to deal with them very cautiously. We want to stay here, we want to c continue our activities in the Dham and we need their support. So there are many questions. How long is it going to be to Arti Prabhu? Five minutes still? Okay, still five minutes. Okay, so then someone says chanting Hare Krishna 
is remembering Krishna. We, we're not able to recognize, but we're not able to recognize Krishna in His holy name. At the same time, we should, we, we just have to listen. What should we do? <laughs> yes, you have to hear the holy name. And we have to also hear the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. It's important for us to hear regularly from the scriptures. Then that will help us to understand more why we are chanting Hare Krishna and, and will help us to appreciate Lord Krishna and the Holy Name. And so, yes, it's all hearing. First we have to hear. We have to hear the Holy Name and we have, but we have to chant also. In the beginning we may not recognize Krishna in His Holy Name, but if we keep chanting, then gradually you will be able to recognize Krishna in His name. It just takes some practice. Here's a quick question. Can we use Samarais on a codice? Yes, you can. It's a codice rice. Samarais is a codice rice. You can use it. Someone says, I want to buy Gornitai deities. What do I need to observe? to structure like how should how should they be what like how should i how should what i need to observe in structure like eyes how should their hands be or their legs belly arms nose well generally these deities are made by the Murtiwalas or Shopa, they are made according to Shopa Shastra and there are dimensions and the proper dimensions are given in scriptures. So people who make deities, usually they're coming in a family who have been making deities for many generations and they know exactly how to make them. Gornitai, you can have Gornitai like we have them in the, with one with one arm up or one with both arms up. It's up to you. We see both poses are there. And sometimes even may have the hand open down. Like if you go to Dhameshwar Mahaprabhu, you see his hands open like that. And so Prabhupada was installing deities with the both arms up. That's generally that's better. But you can take an experienced devotee with you. If you're not, if you're a new devotee, but not so familiar, then take somebody who knows about these things with you, and they can advise you about what is the proper form of the deity. What is the meaning of bhakti? Well, bhakti means devotion. Devotion, when we use bhakti, it means devotion to Krishna. You cannot have the bhakti to demigods or to material things, that's not actually devotion. But bhakti means devotion to Krishna. Then how to surrender to guru properly? How to surrender to guru properly? Well, you have to get instruction from the guru and find out what he wants you to do. We should follow the instructions of the spiritual teacher. If we follow the instructions, then that's surrender. We want to uh, please the spiritual master because the spiritual master should be seen as a representative of Krishna. And if we can follow his instructions, then that's very nice. Someone, what is the difference between information and knowledge? So infor information are just simply some facts, but knowledge means you have actually understood something you're actually understanding what it is. You have some proper 
not just some fact, not just some detail which you know, which you've learned. So no, knowledge is a, a, a higher thing. Okay, so now we'll have our tea and I'll keep these questions for tomorrow and tomorrow night we can try to go on with some of these questions. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Now, one of the places which we're going to visit, which, we're, which is in Navadweep, which is in this town, is Prodamaya. Prodamaya is, means Yoga Maya, and it's a, an, an important deity in Navadweep, in Koladweep. But it's a very crowded place. It's right in the middle of a market, and it's very thick with people. It's very, we, can't, we don't usually go there, but we go past it. You'll see there's a big banyan tree and there's all shops and there's a market. You have to go in the back and the deity of Prodamaya is there. So we're going to hear about this deity now from the body, from Sundarlal Das Brahmachari Prabhu. He, Sundarlal is from Marisha. Lord Rama, however, he is Maryada Avatar. He is teaching the perfect etiquette. He made the vow only to take one wife. But as a king, he had the obligation to perform many sacrifices. It's the duty of the king to engage in performing different yagyas. We read about Maharaj Yudhisthira performing the Rajasuya sacrifice, these different things. So Lord Rama, as a king, ruler of Ayodhya, he would also have to perform sacrifices. And when the king performs a sacrifice, or any man engages in a sacrifice, they expect to sit with their wife. Just like I was telling about Lord Brahma when we were at Puskar, that Lord Brahma was performing a sacrifice. And his wife, uh, Sar first wife, Saraswati, right? S Saraswati. So she was late. And the auspicious time was coming for the yagya. It has to be done at the proper time. So the Brahmins were saying to Lord Brahma that you have to do the sacrifice now, right now, it's the time. He said, well, my wife's coming, she's coming. You know, women are always a little late, you know. <laughs> but when you want them to be on time, then they're not there, right? When you don't want them, that's when they're there. <laughs> Usually, like in the Harinam, they're there when you don't want them, you know? <laughs> so, anyway, Lord Brahma was anxious that my wife's not come. Where is she? Where is she? The Brahma said, we've got to do the Yagya. It's now. This is the time. you got to do it now. So I said, what to do? My wife hasn't come yet. He said, this other girl, take this girl for a wife. <laughs> so they took the other girl. This was Gayatri, right? And then, and she became the second wife of Lord Brahma. So, uh, even Lord Brahma had another wife, you know, took two wives. But, of course, the first wife was angry and she cursed him for that. <laughs> so, Lord Brahma, he, his first wife, Mother Sita, had returned to the earth. So, he has no wife. So, what's he going to do when he has a yagya? So, he had the deities made of Mother Sita. And the, the deity would sit by the side of Lord Rama. And when they would do the sacrifice, Mother Sita would be there in her deity form. And in this way, Lord Rama could keep his vow of only having one wife. Even though she was not present, she was present in her deity form. So Lord Rama was having the deity of Sita. But then, when Lord Rama comes as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Mahaprabhu has left home. And in the case of Lord Rama, it was Mother Sita who had gone. But with Mahaprabhu, well, he's gone. And, and uh, Vishnu Priya is left alone. So she has her deity. She's worshipping Mahaprabhu. So that's the story about Dhameshwar Mahaprabhu. And uh, we also visited the Samadhi and Bhajan Kutir of Jagannath Das Babaji, Siddha. Jagannath Das Babaji, he was uh, the head of all the Babajis in the Navadweep, in the whole of Navadweep. And as we heard earlier in the morning, he had a very special relationship with Bhaktivinoda Thakur. Bhaktivinoda Thakur took Shiksha from him. 
Although he is not the Diksha Guru of Bhakti Vinod Thakur, he, gave, he did give Siksha. So that's a relationship. And some, we sometimes point out that the Parampara is based more on Shiksha than on Diksha. Bhakti Vinod Thakur had taken Diksha from Bipin Bihari. Goswami, somebody else, but he preferred Jagannath Das Babaji, the Shiksha Guru, and his picture was chosen to be in the Parampara. So those pictures which we put on the altar, this was uh, Parampara established by Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. He had picked his picture. He knew his father's relationship with Jagannath Das Babaji. We did want to speak a little bit about this Babaji, uh, initiation because sometimes even we see young people thinking that oh this is better I should be a Babaji rather than a sannyasi right <laughs> rather than a Vaish or rather than a uh, Tridandi sannyasi better to be a Babaji actually Babaji is much higher Babaji's are transcendental sannyasis are still in the material world it's a material ashram you know, we're still on the material platform. But Babaji's are above that. Prabhupada said, white, those people all wearing white, they're more advanced than the people in saffron. White is the color of the Paramahamsas. <laughs> right? So many Paramahamsas here. <laughs> Jai. We're very glad, all of us in Saffron, that we get the association with so many Paramahamsas. So the Babaji's, their business is just chanting Hare Krishna. They're Bhajananandis. There are Gostavanandis and Bhajananandis. The Bhajananandis, they just do their bhajan. Their bhajan means just chanting Japa every day, sit and chant. Just like people, some people read Nectar of Instruction or Upadesham Rita from Rupa Goswami and they read the last verse. Go and ra reside in Radhakund and chant the holy name. So people think, this is it. Go to Radhakund and live there, right? They don't read the first verse. <laughs> they don't read Control the Mind and Senses. They don't read... They don't read about controlling the tongue, they just read, go to Radha Kunt. So this kind of Babaji, this is a serious problem. To actually become, to come to that level of practicing Babaji, you have to be very advanced. We did see one time, in Prabhupada's time, Prabhupada gave one boy Babaji initiation. One time only. There was this one boy, he had actually, he was an American boy, and he'd been preaching. And they brought him to Mayapur and introduced him to Srila Prabhupada. And they say, Prabhupada, this, this young man, is, he's got a serious disease. He's going to die very soon. He's got a big, a serious heart problem. And the doctors told him he hasn't got long to live. And he's going to the colleges and preaching in all the universities. And he's telling the students about how he's preparing for death. So they said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, you should give him sannyas. Prabhupada said, no, no, this is not right. He said, he's going to die. Why will we give him sannyas? He said, we'll give him Babaji. He just has to sit here in Mayapur. He will sit, he can go to Ganga every day and sit there and chant the holy name. He doesn't have to do anything else. Just let him chant the holy name. So the Prabhupada told him, put on white cloth, like the Babaji's, you know, the, the, the short dhoti, you know, and wearing the Babaji dress, and you go there and you sit, you just sit and chant. Your only duty, your only service is to chant the holy name. So he did it for a few weeks, and then, then he went to see another doctor, and doctor said, you're not going to die, nothing wrong with you. He said, what? <laughs> he went back to America, he gave up Krishna consciousness. We never saw him again. <laughs> so Prabhupada said, that's it. No more Babaji's in this car. <laughs> we don't need any more Babaji's. There was one other boy, uh, yeah, not boy, he was a young man. He was from America with a black body. And he was, 
He'd been preaching in Africa and then he came back to Mayapur and he was living in the banana trees. He was living among all the banana trees and he wasn't associating with devotees and he was chanting many, many rounds every day. And he wouldn't eat prasadam with the devotees. He would sneak into the sulab kitchen and he would take the leftovers. He would eat the remnants of the Vaishnavas. You know, that was Haridas Thakur's desire also. When Lord Chaitanya asked Haridas to ask for something, he said, I just want to eat the remnants of the Vaishnavas. But then Haridas said, I'm not qualified to eat the remnants of the Vaishnavas. He said, that, that, that is a very, very special thing to get the remnants of the Vaishnavas. He said, I have no qualification for that. So he prayed to Lord Chaitanya, let me become a dog in the home of the Vaishnavas. So of course, Lord Chaitanya did not give him that kind of and that was Haridasi's extreme humility anyway this young American brahmachari was doing like this he was eating the remnants in the sulab kitchen every day and very little and he was up all night in the banana trees living there and among the banana trees and chanting and Prabhupada said this is Maya he said you go back to Africa and preach he didn't want, he said, this is nonsense, you don't need to be doing this. So also we know, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati had written about this. What kind of Vaishnava are you? Dumi Kishara Vaishnava. Pritistana Gare Nirjanera Gare Tabaharinam Kevala Kaita. That just for the sake of adoration and distinction, you want to sit in a secluded place and chant the holy name. This is what Babaji's are supposed to do. Lord Chaitanya gave instruction to R Raghunath Das Goswami how to execute that Babaji stage of life. He said, you do not eat luxurious food and you should not dress in fine cloth. You should never associate with worldly people. You should only hear the topics of Krishna and Otherwise, just simply chant the holy name. And so this was the, this should be the mood of the Bhajan Anandis. You have to be very advanced to take up that. That is actually for the end of life. So if you have practiced Krishna consciousness throughout your life, then at the end of life, then you can sit down like Bhaktivinoda Thakur at the end of his life he went to Jagannath Puri and he spent the last two years of his life just chanting the holy name and hearing the books of the Goswamis. So like that, Babaji is like that for the end of life. It's not something which we incur. And Prabhupada said he would never do that. He said I will never retire. I want to, he said I want the benediction to die on the battlefield. Two types of death are glorious. One is to die on the battlefield and the other is to die in samadhi. Right? So Prabhupada got both. He was on the battlefield in samadhi fighting for Krishna. So we, we want to follow Srila Prabhupada's example also. There's no retirement in Krishna consciousness. We don't need to become Babaji's, we just need to keep preaching. There's so much to be done. Okay? So thank you very much. All the holy places are here in Navadweep Dham. We said Navadweep Dham is not different from Vrindavan Dham. One time there's a meeting of all the holy places. All the holy places, all the Tirthas and all the presiding deities of the different Dhams. And they, uh, they all gathered to have a meeting at Prayag. But when they had the meeting, they said, hey, something's wrong. Where's Vrindavan? Where's Navadri? Why are they not here? All the holy places have come for the meeting. All the Tirthas have come except for Vrindavan and Navadri. They said, why are they not coming? So they sent a message, what's going on? Why are you not coming for the meeting? And they said, what do you mean? They said, all the holy places are already here in Vrindavan. They're already here in Navadri Dharam. We don't need to go for any meeting of all holy places. Everything's here in this town.
So Pushkar is also here, the original Pushkar. <laughs> Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Yogendra Bandhana, Srinanda Nandana, Praja Chana Paya Hare. Yogendra Bandhana, Srinanda Nandana, Praja Chana Paya Hare. Nabina Nera Rupa Manohara Mohana Bam Sidi Navina Nera Rupa Manohara Mohana Bam Sidi Oh, 
Thakur's wife, she was also worshipping Gaur Gadarhar. They're very merciful. Gaur Nitai are more in the mood of preaching and Sankirtan movement. So the worship of Gaur Nitai is what we encourage devotees to perform in ISKCON. But here these deities of Gaur Gadarhar, we said they're from 500 years ago. Nasrula Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, when he founded the Gaudiya Math, it was at that time that they heard about these deities and they came and they found that they were in a very poor condition and there was no proper worship, there was no regular worship being performed, they were not being properly cared for. But 
by the divine arrangement, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur Srila Prabhupada was able to bring the deities and to establish them here in this place. So we're going to hear now, we have with us a, a resident of Mayapur Dam, Janani Vas Prabhu. Janani Vas Prabhu has been a resident in Mayapur Dam for coming up to 50 years. So he's a very, very senior Dambasi and we're very fortunate that he's here today. He's going to speak to us something first of all about Ritu Dweep. Thank you, Bhakti Purushonam Swami Maharaj. Interesting you are saying, who is God? You said in India there's many gods. I remember I was in Taiwan distributing Bhagavad Gita's and I was talking that this is Bhagavan the song of Bhagavan, Bhagavan is Krishna and the person was surprised, he was saying in India there is God? He said, I thought in India there was no God. <laughs> they were surprised. They thought Indian people, they thought only Christians believe in God. They didn't know that Hindus also have a God. <laughs> so, many different conceptions about God. So your book will certainly be valued. So now today, from here the camp is only three and a half kilometers. <laughs> no, it's a very short distance, come on. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> and we have a wonderful camp, five star hotel waiting for you there. <laughs> Actually better than five star, right? Lokanath Swami said, over our heads will be unlimited stars. <laughs> Better than any Hyatt or Hilton. Unlimited stars. Not five star, not seven star. Unlimited stars. Every night. Okay, we're going to hear, first of all, uh, Pankajangari Prabhu is with us. Pankajangari Prabhu, like his brother, has been a Damvasi for more than, near, coming up to 50 years now. He's going to tell us about Lord Chaitanya's pastimes here. Lord Chaitanya visited this place, Vijayanagar, after he took sannyas. So we'll hear about this from His Grace Pankajangari Prabhu. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Thank you. 
so many rounds with each tongue, right? One round, if I have 16 tongues, then one round with each tongue, right? We make it easy for us. But Rupa Goswami wants to chant more, he wants to chant more, not less. 
we're always trying to chant last. What's the least I can do for Krishna? We're very unfortunate, right? That is our misfortune, that we have no attraction for these holy names. So, Lord Chaitanya then goes on in the third verse to talk more about how to become qualified to chant the holy name. And that third, this third verse, of course, very famous. You can all chant together. Trinada pisa nichena tarora pisa ishnuna amane namaste na kirtaniya sadahari. This verse is so important that Krishna Das Kaviraj has written in the Chaitanya Charitamrita that we should string this verse on a thread and wear it around our neck for constant remembrance. Just like we have our neck beads to remind us that we're devotees, so we should also remember this verse constantly. So he said, put it on a thread, wear it around our neck. So why is this verse so important? Lord Chaitanya is saying, one should be more tolerant than the tree like the tree, just like we see the trees, they tolerate all conditions, the wind, the rain, the heat, but at the same time, the tree is very merciful. It gives flowers, it gives fruit, all of this fruit has come from trees. And so the trees are giving fruit, they're giving shelter, they're providing fuel for people also. This, and, and people may come and cut down the tree. But we should be tolerant, just as the tree tolerates, we should also develop that kind of tolerance. The example is given that a tree may have many fruits. So because it has many fruits, the branches bend low. In the same way, a person who has good qualities will also be humble. Whereas the tree which is very stiff and stands very straight, like the bamboo, it's easily broken. It's very brittle. So in the same way, the proud person, he does not like to bend. It's no good quality. So we want to become tolerant and learn from the tree how to be tolerant. We should be tolerant like a tree, we should uh, think of oneself lower than a straw in the street. The straw is a very tiny dimension, very small size. In the same way, our spirit soul, the dimension of the soul, is one hundredth of one hundredth of the tip of the hair. It's a very small dimension. We should have an ego in proportion to our size. We should not be proud thinking I'm very important, I'm very significant. Rather we should have the ego just like the size of the soul. Just like the grass is very small and people stand on it. After someone stands on the grass, then the grass again becomes straight. The grass is another example for us in tolerance and in giving up false pride. At the same time, we're encouraged to offer all respect to others. Offering all respects to others and not being anxious to be respected ourselves. Amanina manadena, right? Offering respects, give respects to others and do not expect, do not demand any kind of respect for yourself. Prabhupada explains this is real humility, that one is not anxious to be honored or given respect by others. And when one develops these kind of qualities, then the result is Kirtaniyasa Dahari, then you can constantly chant the holy name. Without having these qualities, then it, 
won't be possible to chant. This is the problem. We have to overcome this ego, this false ego, by which we are thinking we are the, the controller. We want to cultivate the mood of being the servant. And so the more we have that mood of offering respects to others and not being anxious to be respected, the more we are become qualified to chant the holy name. And we see Haridas, Thakur, devotees like Rupa and Sanata and Raghuna, how they were so humble, how they were, wherever they go, they would offer so many obeisances to other people. They were so humble, every day offering so many obeisances. So this was their mood in executing Krishna consciousness. We want to try to cultivate that kind of mood. Then Lord Chaitanya goes on to describe further obstacles in the path of chanting the holy name. Number four. Najanam Najanam Nasundarim Kavitamba Jagadishakan Mama Janmani Janmani Shware Babatat Bhakti Ahitaki Pai. Oh mighty Lord, I have no desire to accumulate wealth nor do I want to enjoy any number of followers or have nice poetry praising me or even have uh, beautiful women serving me. I simply want your devotional service, birth after birth. So Lord Chaitanya is uh, giving us warning about these obstacles on the path of spiritual progress. We become attached to wealth. We must be very careful of how we utilize wealth. Of course, living in this modern society, if you don't have any money, that can be a problem. Some countries, when you come to pass through the immigration, they will want to know how much money have you got, all right? If you go to America, probably they would ask you, how much money have you got? They will want to know, if you've no money, then why are you coming here? So, some ways you have to have money, but we should be careful not to become attached to that money and think of that wealth is being for our own material enjoyment. That is a very dangerous problem. As soon as we start to think that this is mine, then we're in Maya. Therefore, in the Krishna Consciousness Movement, we try to be very careful to protect all the devotees from these things. That's why we build big temples like TOVP. Everybody can give all their money there build the temple and you don't don't have any money left for yourself all right the wealth and followers some people want to have followers they want like the idea of people serving them these, these are also problems if we become attached to to this we think this is mine he is my disciple he's my servant this is not very good mood. We should understand everything in relation to Krishna. Don't be attached to money, don't be attached to having followers, to having people serve. We have to learn to live without depending on others. And we saw that example. We see Lord Chaitanya going to South India. And how did he go? He was going just with he had one, he didn't want to take one servant, but the devotees insisted, you must take somebody with you. But every day he would go for begging, every, and then whatever they have in one day, they will use it. Nothing left, they wouldn't keep anything until the next day. That, that was the Lord Chaitanya's mood in executing sannyas. Using everything, not, not accumulating. 
this is a tendency in the material world. We want to accumulate. I have this much today, I'll get more tomorrow, and I'll get more the next day, and this way I'll have more and more. This is a danger. We have to see everything in relation to Krishna for the service of Krishna. Then we can properly chant the holy name. So these are uh, obstacles in the path of devotional service. Well, followers, women, these things. Generally, you find somebody's got a lot of money. If a man's got a lot of money, women will be there. If a woman has a lot of money, men will be there. Yeah, it, it attracts the opposite sex. Therefore, you have to be very careful to use it properly in the service of Krishna before you use it in the service of Maya. If we don't use it for Krishna, we'll use it for Maya. In the fifth verse, we can recite, Ayinandatanu jakinkaram patitam mam vishame pavam buddho kripayata vapada pankaja sita duli satrisham vachintaya O son of Maharaj Nanda Krishna, I am your eternal servant. And though I am so, I have fallen into this ocean of birth and death. Please pick me up from the ocean of death and fix me as one of the atoms at your lotus feet. All right? So Lord Chaitanya is not asking for liberation. That's another point which is actually there in the previous verse. Lord Chaitanya said, I simply want devotional service, birth after birth. So generally people are thinking about getting liberation. They want that. I want to get freedom. I want to go back to Godhead. I want to get out of this material world. But Lord Chaitanya teaches us just to pray for devotional service, birth after birth. This is at the advanced mood. Devotee, devotee is not asking, take me out of this world, but he's simply saying, please engage me in your service. And so, son of Man Nanda Maharaj Krishna, I am your servant. Somehow or other, I've fallen into this world. How we fell here, we don't know. How we got it, the Prabhupada said, that's not important. It's a very difficult thing to understand how we got here. Just understand the easiest thing, how to get out. And this is what the Sankirtan is all about. The more we're engaged in Sankirtan, and Sankirtan means in a broad sense glorifying Krishna. Not just only Harinam Sankirtan, but any service which is glorifying Krishna. The more we're absorbed in that mood of glorifying Krishna, then the more we're qualified to get out of this material world. So Lord Chaitanya prays, please pick me up, fix me as one of the atoms at your lotus feet. This is the mood of a devotee. We simply want to be at the, at the lotus feet of Krishna. Right? The devotees are all eager to take shelter at the lotus feet of Krishna. But Prabhupada explains to us, what is the meaning of feet? You know, people often come, they want to touch your feet. That is nonsense. Just come and touch somebody's feet. Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada would chastise people for that. He said, Have you, are you qualified to touch someone's feet? What right have you got to touch someone's feet? Without being free of sin, you have no qualification. We want to take shelter at the lotus feet of Krishna. It means, feet means service. Sometimes Prabhupada would say, no one should touch my feet. Right? Some, sometimes Prabhupada had that, he would, he would be like that, be concerned that people were touching his feet. And the idea is by touching their feet, you give your sins to that person. Not a very nice thing to do, is it? You know, I'm a sinful person, so here, let me touch your feet and you can take my karma for me. Well, very kind. Thank you very much.
and now I'll go off and do more sins. And in the future I'll find somebody else, touch their feet, I'll give them that sins. This is not the proper thinking of a devotee. When Lord Chaitanya talks about taking shelter at the lotus feet of Krishna, feet means service. Prabhupada would say, feet means service. He said, better you bring me my slippers. Don't just come and touch my feet. Bring me my slippers. In other words, do some service. If you take the opportunity to do some service for the devotee, then that is powerful. That will purify us. Not just simply touching the feet of the person, but actually doing some service. So the more we're engaged in service of Krishna, the more we're sheltered at the lotus feet of Krishna. So these first five verses are describing to us more about the process of sadhana bhakti. As we go on, we see these eight verses describing progressively different levels of Krishna consciousness. The first five verses are more on the level of sadhana bhakti. Now, coming to the sixth verse, we'll hear about some bhava bhakti, right? We'll chant the sixth verse. Nayanam galadashrudaraiha vadanam gadgadharudayakira pulakaya nichitam papu kada tavanam agrahin bhavishyati. Oh mighty Lord, when will my eyes be decorated with love flowing constantly when I chant your holy name? When will my words choke up on uttering your holy name? When will all the hairs on my body stand on end at the recitation of your holy name? So these are descriptions of bhava. Bhava means devotional service in ecstasy. We should understand this is a very exalted level of devotional service. Now to come to that level of bhava, there are special, there are certain qualifications. And you can read about these different qualifications. Kavi Chandra Swami was mentioning tonight about Nectar of Devotion. A very important book written by Srila Prabhupada. Now sometimes I give class on the Nectar of Devotion and devotees say, what is this book? I've never heard of this book. It's a, a, a great shame because Srila Prabhupada said nectar of devotion should be the handbook for the Krishna conscious devotees. So in the nectar of devotion, Shula, which is Prabhupada's summary study of Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, written by Rupa Goswami, Prabhupada describes there, he listed the different symptoms of bhava, the different rather uh, yeah, symptoms or qualifications of one who is on the level of bhava, that is totally absorbed in devotional service. He has no thought of any material considerations. He is utilizing every moment of his time for the service of Krishna. And he's very attached to residing in the holy dham, Hearing about Krishna is very important for him. His mind is drawn. He's so attached. He wants to hear very intensely about Krishna and be engaged in Krishna's service. So when one develops these symptoms, one comes to gradually to the level of bhava. We should understand it's not a quick thing, it takes some time, it's a gradual process. To come to that level of bhava takes some time. We have to practice devotional service intensely. Now sometimes people argue that, oh Srila Prabhupada, his process of Krishna consciousness is just for neophytes, it's all sadhana bhakti, there's no Raga Bhakti, there's no Raganuga Bhakti there, there's no spontaneous mood of devotion. But actually this is not correct. And we see within our Krishna consciousness movement 
there is a lot of opportunity for devotees to cultivate that Raganuga mood in the service of Krishna. Just like we are singing different songs like Jai Radha Madhava, so this is describing more uh, very confidential pastimes of Radha and Krishna. And then we have also every morning we play the Govinda prayers, mantra pasana, we can absorb our mind meditating on the Lord, on the deities, and the different devotion, the different uh, moods in serving the deities. This is all Raganuga Bhakti. It, everything depends on us, on what is our mood, what is our attitude in performing devotional service. If we want to be mechanical, if we want to be on the level of sadhana bhakti, then that's our problem. But we can also come to the higher level of devotional service. We can also become Raganuga bhaktas and at the same time be engaged in Krishna consciousness here. So Lord Chaitanya is describing what are the symptoms of one on this level of bhava, the trembling of the body, tears from the eyes, hair standing on end, these are all symptoms of bhava. And these come about the more we're intensely absorbed in service to Krishna. However, one should never make a show of such symptoms. And anybody who has some, any problem like that, if they actually feel themselves inspired in this way, they feel trembling of the body or tears from the eye, then go out of the temple and go to a private place and go into seclusion on your own until the bhava has gone. Don't make a public exhibition of such things. This is the problem, that people take these things to be very cheap and they want to make a show that I'm an elevated devotee, I'm an advanced devotee. Just like sometimes we bring some very new people here to the Holy Dham, and then when they come to the Holy Dham, they say, Oh, I'm seeing Radha and Krishna. Oh, I saw Lord Chaitanya and the Panchatattva. I saw them all, they appeared before me dancing. And did you do anything? Did you offer your obeisances to them? No. Why not? Well, I don't know. <laughs> so like this, you know, uh, we have to understand, we, we don't take these kind of remarks very seriously, you know, new people. And the, the point is, uh, you know, we, we don't make a public exhibition of this. If somebody is actually feeling some ecstasy, well, we were hearing today, uh, Maharaj was describing that Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati told his disciple, if you were feeling ecstasy, then that's a problem. The fact that you're not having ecstasy, that's good. But if you were, if you were having ecstasy, then I'd be more worried about you. All right, then. Shikshastikam then goes on, number seven, describing higher levels of Bhava Bhakti. Yugayatam nimeshena chakshusha pravrishayatam shunyayatam jagat sarvam govinda virahe name. Oh Govinda, feeling your separation, I'm considering one moment to be like twelve years or more, and tears are flowing from my eyes like torrents of rain. I'm feeling all vacant in this world in your absence. I'm feeling all vacant in this world in your absence. We don't want to feel vacant, right? Vacant, vacant, to void, that's not, that's not our philosophy. <laughs> that's not what we want. And the verse says, one moment becomes like 12 years or more. The example is there of the gopis, that they were cursing Lord Brahma because that he made such bad eyes that every moment when the eyes blink we're not able to see the form of Krishna. So to lose sight of Krishna for even a moment was unbearable for the gopis. So that this is a, 
thinking of devotees on this high level of Krishna consciousness, that one moment becomes like 12 years. You guys tell nimishena, nimishena, just a, a moment, a fraction of a second. It becomes like 12 years. It seems like such a long time. So the gopis, the, those people who have intense love for Krishna, they feel that kind of separation from the Lord. And, and they feel that vacancy, they feel all vacant in the world. The, the world has no meaning, there's no more purpose. If everything becomes void and vacant, there's no more purpose to living. Why am I here? There's no point to be here anymore. So this is the thinking on this level of devotion. It's so intense. The fire of separation is so strong. And then finally, Lord Chaitanya concludes in the eighth verse describing the highest level of prima bhakti, pure love of God. Asli shiva padaratam panastumam adarshana marmahatam karotu va yatatatava vididatu lampato mat prananatas tu saivanapara. This verse is actually the words of Srimati Radharani. That she is addressing Krishna. Lord Chaitanya was expressing the mood of Srimati Radharani when he spoke this verse. The Srimati Radharani is a, addressing Krishna. She's calling him Lampata. Lampata means your womanizer. Lusty person. That she's saying to Krishna that if my unhappiness is what makes you happy, then that is my happiness. Right? Did any married man hear that from his wife? Will any woman tell her husband, if my unhappiness makes you happy, then that is my happiness. This kind of love is only in the spiritual world. It's only there between Radha and Krishna. But we want to understand, we want to appreciate this, that this is, a, the, mo this is the mood of Srimati Radharani. That by Krishna not being present before me, that if this is what makes Krishna happy, then that is my happiness. So this kind of intense love, unconditional love, this is the perfection, this is the goal of life, right? There is Prayojana, there's Sambandha, Abhidaya, Prayojana. This final verse is describing Prayojana, the goal of life, to develop this unconditional love for the Supreme Lord. So in this way, Lord Chaitanya has given us these eight verses, and the Acharyas explain to us that these verses ex explain all the different levels of Krishna consciousness. They take us from the beginning, from the, el the beginning of Krishna consciousness, Shraddha, developing faith. They take us through the different levels of devotion to Prima Bhakti, to the goal of life. So in eight verses, Lord Chaitanya has summarized the whole philosophy of Krishna consciousness. So Srila Prabhupada has given us these verses. We, we are reciting them daily. We see in Mayapur every morning that devotees recite them. And generally, devotees, we should all want to know these verses and try to enter into this mood of shikshastikam and feeling the, the, the connection with Lord Chaitanya by remembering his instructions. Okay, so we will stop here. We have some fruit to distribute for everyone. Tomorrow morning, uh, tomorrow morning we're going to leave early.
We're leaving a little earlier than usual tomorrow because we're taking a boat ride first. We'll be going by boat at, uh, we'll leave here about 5.30 instead of 6 o'clock. Because first of all we take a boat and we'll take some time for everyone to get in the boats. The devotees from Mayapur, they will be taking their boat from Prabhupada Ghat and we'll meet them at the same place which is down at Shankarpur, some distance away from here. Okay? So, we ask all of you, you can have a good night's rest. Okay, you can make a line. We'll give up. <laughs> No, if you if you don't make a line, you won't get prasada. You gotta make a line. Line. You know. <laughs> Shankarpur and uh, in the time of Shankaracharya, Shankaracharya had come here. Shankaracharya was preaching his Mayavada philosophy everywhere. Shankaracharya we know to be incarnation of Lord Shiva and I think Padma Purana is stated Mayavadam Asatshastram Prachanam Bodhamuchati. Lord Shiva tells his wife that in the Kali Yuga I will come in the guise of a Brahmana and I will teach this Mayavada philosophy, Asatshastra. It's a temporary philosophy. It's not Sanatan Dharma. It's not an eternal religion. It's Asatshastra. Prachinam Bodham Uchite. And it is presented in the form of covered Buddhism. Because before Shankaracharya came, India was covered with Buddhism. Everyone was a Buddhist. Even Mathura was like the capital of Buddhism. Mathura, the birthplace of Lord Krishna, had become the capital of Buddhism. And people were worshipping Jagannath and they were thinking Lord Jagannath is also Buddha. <laughs> you go to the museum, the, the, in, the museum there in Mathura and all is just full of Buddhas. All Buddha statues, Buddha idols are there in the museum, showing us what was there in the past. So it was the special contribution of Shankaracharya that he presented this uh, Mayavada philosophy, Prachanam Buddham. It was actually Buddhism in a covered form. Buddhist, the, the Buddhist philosophy is preaching voidism, that everything is ultimately zero, nothing is real. All right, that's the philosophy of the Buddhism. That nothing is real, the world is unreal, so you are not real, nothing is real, ultimately everything is zero. So Shankaracharya changed it a little and said, no, it's not zero, it's one. All right, just a little adjustment from nothing to one. And that one he was Brahman. Sarvam Kauvidam Brahma, that everything is Brahman. And so Shankaracharya in this way was able to defeat Buddhism. Even today the Buddhists are scratching their heads and wondering how is it possible that Buddhism was defeated and taken out of India. Of course the Buddhism came here, it was a temporary arrangement by the Lord to uh, take people away from 
animal sacrifice because in the name of the Vedas, the Brahmanas were encouraging animal sacrifice. The Brahmins had become corrupted and degraded, materialistic, and they were encouraging people in animal slaughter. So Lord Buddha came and presented his atheistic philosophy. And then after Lord Buddha, then Shankaracharya came, and by Shankaracharya's preaching, he was able to bring back the Vedas. He brought back the Vedas along with Brahmins who were very strict, who were very uh, pure and strict in their habits. Although they were followers of the Mayavada philosophy, still they were very renounced. And so this brought back the Vedic culture. Buddhism was rejecting the Vedic culture. No more need for Brahmanas. If you don't have the Vedas, then you don't need Brahmanas anymore. But Shankaracharya brought back the Vedas and established the Varnashram system with good Brahmanas and with sannyasis. But, of course, Shankaracharya was preaching the Mayavada philosophy. And Lord Chaitanya has told us, Mayavadi Aparadi. The, the Mayavadis are the greatest offenders to the Lord. Anyone who even hears this Mayavada philosophy is doomed. So Lord Chaitanya was very strict in who he associated with. He, he could give mercy to materialistic, sinful people. But he was very careful about Mayavadis. And we see how he reacted when, a, when Advaita Acharya began to preach the Mayavada philosophy. The Lord Chaitanya came there and beat him. And so Lord Chaitanya has taught us to be very careful about this Mayavada philosophy. Uh, Prabhupada also told us uh, that, especially in India, that whenever you look a little closely at the philosophy of the people, if you scratch the surface a little, you find Mayavada philosophy. It goes very deep. And so, therefore, Srila Prabhupada's mission was Nirvashesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Deshatarini. Prabhupada was preaching Gauravani Pracharini, preaching the message of Lord Chaitanya to defeat these two things, Nirvashesha and Shunyavada, the Mayavada philosophy and the Voidus philosophy. Not only in the Western world, of course, but Prabhupada began his preaching in the Western world, his real preaching, and then he brought it back here into India. So, very important for us to uh, be aware of this Mayavada philosophy. Shankaracharya did great service for the Lord in bringing back the Vedas, but at the same time it was a threat that it made people atheistic because if everything is one then it means we're all God and so if we're all God there's no meaning to being God anymore is there you know if you're all God and I'm also and we're all God we're all Krishna and we're all Brahman then there's no meaning to being God anymore so actually Mayavada is atheistic philosophy and so we want to preach the message of Lord Chaitanya that not that we're not God but we're a tiny part of the Supreme Lord and the different Vaishnava Acharyas they all presented this philosophy we'll be hearing about that in a little while Lord Chaitanya of course taught Achintya Beda Beda Tadva simultaneously one and different we're one with the Supreme Lord yet at the same time different from him so Shankaracharya had come into this place here and Lord Goranga appeared to him and told him you don't need to come here because this place is all, everyone is devotee here. So we don't need your Mayavada philosophy. Mayavada philosophy is where the people become atheistic and given up the Vedas. So it was presented in that particular time in the, those particular circumstances. But here in Navadvip Dham, this is the holy place and everyone here 
is actually devotee and they're very respectful to the Vedic culture. So Shankaracharya was told, you go other places. You're not needed here in the Holy Dhamma. There's no problem here. We have many devotees here. Okay, so this is the main event which took place here, but the many other great personalities also came here. Different Vaishnava Acharyas also visited here. Son, I'm sure there's hunger pains in his belly. Why doesn't he? Maybe you should give him some food, you know. Ah. Hey, Sridhar. Sridhar. Hey, just see. We are also gentle people here. Okay. We are also. Okay, dead. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, day, day time you can, you can chant, 
loudly. But even night, my dear uncle, just she do something. Is it, is it even night also disturbing? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Hey. The name of Krishna. Hey. Can you see? I am also Brahman. Just see. Just see. I am also Brahman. Okay. <laughs> you can't control. Okay. We'll complain to the chat, Kaji, then we'll, then we'll understand. Yes, sir? If you don't stop all this chanting, you're going to wake up the Lord. The Lord's sleeping. <laughs> And your chanting is going to wake him up. And if you wake him up, he'll be angry. When he's angry, then we won't get rain. And if there's no rain, the price of rice will go up. If there's no rice, we'll all go hungry. It'll be your fault. We'll beat you. Sridhar. Oh, Sridhar. Let's see. You are full number one. <laughs> really, you are full number one. You are selling just a simple banana. Here, everywhere is banana. Who will buy you? Who will buy from you? All I need is just one person to buy. Whole day you are sitting in the market and to buy one person. You're really, you are a full number one. One person you are waiting for, a one person. Just see. Dear uncle, you see our opulent, big building, big house, big, big building, you know, you know, that mantra I need. Hare Krishna. So, you see, we are watching Maha, Mago, Kali, Kali, and see our opulent, see, Kali, you see, hey. Dear uncle, maybe he's hungry. Maybe whole day and night is disturbing. Oh, is he, very good. Is he hungry? <laughs> hey, go, don't disturb it. Go. Even simply Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna disturbing. Come on, come on. He spends half his money worshipping the Ganga. Yes. That's what I. Yes. If I uh, give it to us, we're Brahmins who get more benefit, right? <laughs> I, he doesn't what? have any money, that's the problem. <laughs> Sometimes I can take some serious to money from that. I just sell bananas and put them out there. Okay. Please, my dear. Uh -huh. Please excuse me for being such a fool, but what can I say? Only uh -huh. I know what I can say. Therefore, I told you, my dear uncle, therefore, I told him, he's a really crack. <laughs> really crack. He's so poor, no, no proper food. You just see that glass, no, uh, no proper glass or should to drink water. And Hare Ram, Hare Krishna, Hare Ram, Hare Krishna. What is this? We need to crack his head, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, get some sleep at night. <laughs> so, okay. I'll try, my friend, I'll try. Siddhar, Siddhar, we are going to our uh, king, Chandkaji, to complain about you. And don't, don't hold whole day and night, Ram Ram Kitty Kitty, Ram Ram Kitty Kitty, simply, <laughs> simply disturb it. Go, uh, don't disturb, okay, you can, you, you, you do here at your home. Don't disturb, okay? Hare. Let's go to the supermarket. Thank you, Prabhu. But he was able to gather thousands of people to join with him to march in protest against the Chankasi. And they're not allowed in the Vedas, in the Kali Yuga. So in this way, the, the, the Lord Chaitanya established how it was not proper to kill animals. And the Chankasi also agreed 
that actually the scriptures, the Quran, was actually being misinterpreted and they should not be killing so many, they should not be killing the cows as they are doing. <laughs>